Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. I am very honored to be here. I'm delighted to be supporting this initiative. Um, as, as Daniel said, I have worked, I have had the privilege of working in very different settings. Um, in First of all, in Nigeria, where I qualified as a medical doctor, worked in in clinical infectious diseases, health maintenance organizations, um, before uh, further studies here and work here in the National Health Service in um, uh, a private industry, if you like, and, and, and also local government. So I have a fair um, uh, view of healthcare systems and how healthcare systems generate value um, and um, and so whether that is across um, Nigeria or in the UK or actually internationally where a lot of my study has um, covered. So I think it, I'll, I'll just share my screen in a, in a moment. And, and um, I think one of the things it will be, that will be helpful to just start with is to set out what I don't think this session is. Um, and then that will lead us into what I think it is. So first of all, this session is not an in-depth um, health economic session on the healthcare value chain. So if I was if I was um, taking a session in health economics, uh, as I do with master's degree students in Cardiff University, um, if I was doing one of my health economics sessions, I would go into extreme details about the healthcare value chain. But I don't think that's what this is. So you won't have a 30 minute lecture from me on the healthcare value chain. Well, I think what it is all about is about opportunities in that value chain. But more than those opportunities, it's a mentor's perspective. So I've been very privileged over the past how many years of my professional life to be mentored. That's, that's an important starting point. But I've also mentored many people and I do mentor, um, whether they are um, master's degree students or whether they are executives or whether they are professionals across healthcare and local government. So I'm going to bring a perspective of a mentor um, to the opportunities in the healthcare value chain. But I think for your benefit, for your benefit, especially if you don't necessarily have a very, very solid academic background in the healthcare value chain, I'll just describe it. Um, for for the purpose of getting us to the end point. I'm hoping I'm not going to speak endlessly for 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 an hour. That that won't happen. I'll probably will speak for maybe I think 20 minutes or thereabout, and then uh, we can take questions and interact and have have uh, um, uh, uh, co comments. So I think a right place to start is to ask what is the value chain. Now, one of the um, uh, people who's done a very extensive work on the value chain in healthcare is Michael Porter, who is an, a, a, a Harvard academic. And he introduced this concept of the value chain being, value chain being the entire production chain from the input of raw materials to the output of a final product consumed by the end user. Now, that in itself is very powerful because what it, what it gives you is a very generic description of the value chain that you can translate in the context of healthcare, but also in pretty much every other context. This idea that you have inputs of raw materials and you, over, you overlay on them processes, what we call the, the factors of production. When we did economics in, in, in school, we were taught that the factors of production were land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. So you, you put your raw materials together, you overlay labor and manual skill on them, you produce a final product that is consumed by the end user. But that's exactly where the concept of value comes in. Because oftentimes people look at that and they think that the value is the products you produce. So that's why I've put the picture of the ice lolly. Now, uh, um, for those of, for people who know me, I'm a, stick, I'm a stickler for my ice lollies. I like to have ice lollies. Um, whether it's winter, whether it's summer, makes no difference to me. Um, I just like to have ice lollies. But, but my wife doesn't like ice lollies. Um, for them, for her, it's too sensitive for her teeth. And she can't believe that I have ice lollies in the thick of winter. So, um, so two people 
may have the same product. As you can see, there are three hands there, all eating ice lollies. So it's the same product. It's the same ice lolly. It's perhaps the same amount of sugar in them, perhaps the same amount of milk in them, or whatever content is in them. But the value that they offer to the individual consumer varies from individual to individual. And so it is a mistake to think that once I've done my production process, put all my inputs together and manufactured my ice lolly, that my ice lolly is what is, is what my value is. That's not, that's not really the value. It is the utility or the welfare that the consumer derives from it that really is your value. So hold on to that thought because for, to understand the opportunities in the value chain, you must understand that the consumer thinks about value. And the consumer does not think about value as beginning and ending exclusively with the products in their hands. They think about the welfare or the utility they derive from the products in their hands. And the only way you can understand that is to talk to the consumer. So that concept of going from inputs to outputs um, as describing the value chain, I think is a very important one. And then it's also the means by which business activities that transform inputs can be identified and analyzed. I've just talked about the factors of production being land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. To understand the value chain, you need to be able to break down the value chain in whatever business you're involved in. I, I'm, I'm a healthcare executive currently, and um, we, we run three district general hospitals in a population of 451,000 people. Understanding value for the different segments of our customers is the key element of the work that I do because that is the way you begin to generate value for your entire business. What do the consumers want? People who are in this population who have osteoarthritis, what do they need? People who are in this population who have cancer, what do they want? Understanding that your product is not just your value, but your product is what will bring value to the end, and to the end user is really important. So identifying and analyzing the different parts of the value chain is really crucial. And Brown took more of an industry perspective to, 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 to Porter. And what he did was to define it as a tool for disaggregating a business into what I described as strategically relevant activities. So whether that is the, the, the inputs of the nurse combined with the inputs of the doctor, combined with the inputs of the porter who cleans the wards, all of that is important in the healthcare value chain, strategically breaking down um, um, the business into relevant activities and how those activities connect with one another. So that in a nutshell is what the value chain is. And when you, when you look at descriptions of the value chain, one of the most consistent descriptors you will see is what I've placed here. And this is the most common description of the healthcare value chain. It starts with a pair. Okay, so the payer in this case is the person or the group of people who bring out the money from the pockets to pay for health care. And they could be governments, they could be individuals, or they could be employers. So here in the United Kingdom, the payers are fundamentally governments because the National Health Service is a state-funded service. Um, if you were in Nigeria, the payer would be individuals and largely largely individuals, a little bit of government, and a little bit of employers who buy into HMO insurance packages. If you were in the United States of America, the payer would fundamentally be individuals and employers and very little of government, but government gets involved through Medicaid and Medicare. So the point of all of that is that context matters. So the, the payers in the Nigerian setting, very different from the payers in the UK setting and very different from the payers in the United States setting. And then the next point of that value chain is what we call the fiscal intermediaries. So the fiscal intermediaries are the people essentially who take the money from the payer and buy from the provider. And they, that's classically insurers. But also a, a critical part of the fis, fiscal intermediary there is the health maintenance organizations. So if you live and work in Nigeria, you'd understand that HMOs have blossomed in the past 20, 20 years or thereabouts. I talked about having worked in one of the largest HMOs in Nigeria before I came to the UK in 2003. So HMOs are all are, are fiscal intermediaries. They essentially take money from the payer and pay the provider. But more importantly, and I will dwell on this in a moment to understand what HMOs have done, because HMOs have done what we call vertical integration. 
because they start off as providers, and that's the next point on the value chain, is the provider, that's the hospitals, the physicians. So HMOs essentially, uh, they started off as providers and they did vertical integration down towards the payer and took on the role of the fiscal intermediary so that you then have HMOs that are functioning as providers and intermediaries. They take the money from the payer and they pay themselves to provide health services for the payer. So when we think about the opportunities in the healthcare value chain, I want you to hold up the HMOs as important players uh, in that to understand how HMOs have crystallized and taken advantage of opportunities in healthcare value chain. And then further up on that value chain is the purchasers. So these are the people who do the wholesale and the distribution. They take from the, from the um, medical um, device manufacturers and the drug manufacturers, and then they sell to the providers. So, and it can be, you know, medicines on a large scale. It can be computers on a large scale. It can be iPhones on a large scale. Uh, so my health board, for example, provides iPhones for people like me who do on calls. Now, they don't buy, they don't go buying one iPhone. They get the iPhone on scale. And, and so in a sense, that is the role of the wholesalers. They buy the medications on scale, buy the equipment that are important for the production of healthcare, and then they put it into the providers. And if you are if you are working in the UK, you will know straight off that many NHS trusts, for example, are increasingly functioning as providers that are vertically integrating as purchasers. So they purchase in bulk. So they are important in that in that in that value chain. And then finally, of course, on the top of that value chain is the producer. So the people who produce the drugs and the people who produce the medical devices and manufacturers. So if you're very interested in the healthcare value chain, there's what I've just given you about the healthcare value chain. It's probably about 5% of the academic material on the healthcare value chain. But that's just the 5% the that I think you need to allow us get collectively into that concept of what are the opportunities in here. Um, so there is this question of why has there been great interest in the healthcare value chain if you work in the healthcare industry if you have any interest in the healthcare industry you must know that the healthcare value chain has been uh, growing in importance and i think there are two reasons in my view the first one is the realities of vertical integration so i've talked about how hmos have integrated um, um, vertically. Let me see if this might help you describe. So there is, so this is, and I, I want to describe uh, vertical integration here. So I've taken that chart and, and essentially lay, laid it vertically. And you can see the governments, individuals, employers, HMOs and insurers, um, hospitals and physicians, wholesalers, and then drug and, and medicines manufacturers. Now, downstream integration is any integration that takes you closer to the payer or to the individual, whereas upstream integration is any integration that takes you closer to the producer. Now, think about what HMOs have become. When I started working in, 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 in the HMO in Lagos um, in, in 2001, um, it was a network of hospitals that then morphed into saying, look, instead of just having doctors and nurses who provide care, um, how about if we went to governments or went to employers and said to them, look, if you paid us a certain amount of money per capita of your employers, we will guarantee a, unit, a minimum basic uh, package of healthcare for your staff. And that may be two annual health checks. It may be immunization and screening for their families. It may be general um, uh, medical care and antenatal care. It won't include emergency surgery. It won't include elective surgery. It won't include ophthalmological care and all of that. But it will have a, you know, so, and employers look at that and go, actually, that actually makes sense for us financially. So we'll buy into it. So HMOs morphed through vertical integration, but it was downstream uh, vertical integration. They went from being providers and became fiscal intermediaries. So HMOs operate in these two boxes. And I made reference also to the fact that some healthcare providers, particularly in the United Kingdom, in the NHS, if you're a foundation trust, they've done a, a little bit of upstream vertical integration to also become purchasers. So they buy massively in, in bulk. So one of the realities of the healthcare value chain 
is the is the realization that almost in a in a in a very surreptitious manner, a vertical integration was already going on downstream and upstream in different healthcare markets. And that was driving conversations about what is going on here, why are they doing it, and what value is it giving them? Well, the value is giving them is strategic advantage, a competitive edge. And so bear that in mind for when we talk about, when I reflect on what I think the HMOs of the future will be like and what they will be doing. And then there, I also talked about the upstream integration uh, that is integrating or incorporating wholesale and distribution. And then there's the horizontal integration, which is essentially consolidation of practice. Again, if you work here in the UK, you probably have heard about um, GP federations. So maybe when 10 GPs come together, general practitioners come together and say, you know what, we serve a population of 200,000 people. If we joined up our services, we are still individual practices, but we can federate and our federation would allow us to um, cut down on the cost of back office so we can get economies of scale, we can get one IT provider, we can get one IT system that will speak to one another so our patients would not be hopping from one practice to the other and repeating their story. So they think about efficiencies, they think about patient safety, they think about um, 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 quality of, of care, and at the end of the day, they think about the bottom line. So that consolidation of practice can happen vertically, but it can also happen horizontally. So it is the realities of vertical and horizontal integration that have pretty much driven rising interest in the healthcare value chain. And then there's this element that says, well, there's the traditional approach to, to understanding the healthcare value chain, and then there's the modern approach. The traditional approach says you go from inputs to outputs. Now, here, listen very carefully here. Because I think this is, from my perspective in, in, in the years that I've mentored, um, one of the things I've often seen, and maybe I'm mentoring an entrepreneur, someone who is, who is an entrepreneur, and I go, so you, you, uh, w w w what is it that you would describe as your most urgent need? What's the tool you need now? And they go, what I need is resources. What I need is capital. And I go, okay, okay, I get that. Every entrepreneur needs resources and capital. But the question I'm asking you, what is your greatest need now? Oh, well, resources and capital. No. What is your greatest need now? Well, actually, your greatest need is not resources and capital. Your greatest need is a need. Your greatest need is a, a very clear vision. Your greatest need is a very thorough understanding of the value you are proposing to add to the customer. Until you understand exactly what value you are proposing to add to the customer, you cannot command resources. And actually, if you were given resources, you would waste resources. So the, the first thing is that there is now recognized a, a very clear shift away from the traditional approach to healthcare value chain that goes, we start with our inputs, our resources. We put production processes on them and we end up with a product. And then we try to sell the product to a consumer and see who needs it. And the modern approach to the healthcare value chain completely turns that on its head and says, actually, your starting point is to understand what does the customer need? Because once you understand what the customer needs, that's what we call the customer values and expectations. And to, to, to help you understand what I mean by the customer values and expectations, I need to say this, that every customer acquisition process has a cost to it. And every customer, before they enter into a transaction, calculates the costs of being a customer and balance it against the expected benefits of processing or effecting that, that um, transaction. Now, let me give you a very simple example. I have a headache, right? And so I sit down and say, oh my goodness, I've got this headache. I need to go and see my doctor. So I'm about to, to engage in a transaction, that transaction being to see the doctor. But I sit down and ask myself, and every one of us does this, so I'm not talking about something that is hypothetical. So I sit down and ask myself, I need to go and see my doctor. Um, but for me to see my doctor, I need to get up and get dressed. That's a cost. Um, when I get dressed, I need to walk to the bus stop that is 15 minutes away because I don't have a car. It's 15 minutes away. We're in the thick of winter. It's cold, blustery in, in Wales. Um, and then when I get to my GP, I'm going to sit 30 minutes in the waiting room, waiting for the GP. And then eventually I'm going to see the GP. Now, by the time I calculate all of that cost, I think about the value that I'm going to get, the benefit that I'm going to get from that interaction. 
And the benefits that I get from the interaction with the doctor is going to be determined by the intensity of my headache. My headache is very, very severe. My calculation is going to be that the care that I'll get from the doctor will overwhelm the costs that I incur from going to see the doctor. If the headache is not that severe, I'm going to simply make the calculation, you know what, I'm just going to pop a paracetamol or just slip out this headache. So the point of all of that is that customers make calculations about value. And the fact that you have a product does not necessarily mean that value is guaranteed. So you need to understand, first of all, what does the customer value and what is their expectation? And then once you understand that, you are straight off into the territory of core competencies, process, and assets. So what competencies do I have to meet this expectation? What are my capabilities? What are my resources? What are my skills? What production processes do I need to lay on that? What assets do I have? Understanding the first two then allows you to set out what we call a value proposition. And a value proposition is like, for example, if you are an orthopedic surgeon, you can go into a village and say, well, I'm the only orthopedic surgeon here, so I'm going to set up an orthopedic clinic because there are people who have osteoarthritis. What you haven't done is that you think that just giving people surgery for their knees will resolve the pain. But actually, if you don't talk to the people, you won't understand that what they really need is not a resolution of their pain. What they really need is to be able to walk distances without being disabled or dysfunctional. So it is important to understand what the customer values. Once you understand what the customer values and what your competencies and capabilities are and what your resources are, then that allows you to set out a very clear value proposition. And with your clear value proposition, then you'll be able to think about how am I going to generate very clear value here? I'll say this and I'll move on to the last um, um, one or two slides. There's a piece of work that we did recently here in Wales, and it was driven by this concept of value. So uh, I, I, so I wanted to, to, to understand in our population of 450,000 people, there is one of our more deprived populations in the Rhonda Valleys. And so what we wanted to understand was to segment. So we used um, 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 a, a diff, um, statistical methods to segment the population, not on the basis of the disease they have, but on the basis of needs that they have. And by the time we segmented the population, we created 10 natural segments in that population. And it was very interesting because you could then look at segment four and segment nine. They look similar on every other thing in terms of the numbers of long-term conditions that they have, in terms of their healthcare service utilization or demand. But one fundamental area where they differed was on the preponderance of lifestyle behaviors that endanger health. So one, was very low in terms of smoking. The other was the highest in terms of smoking. Now, if you're going to offer health services to segment four, they will be completely different from the kind of health services you offer to segment nine without understanding the need of that particular population, which I describe as customer values and expectations. You offer blind services that don't meet the need. And that is how value is driven away. So understanding population need, understanding what your customer base wants, understanding that through surveys, for example, and the sort of analytical work that I just made reference to is what allows you to understand. So, and this is really important. I'm going to stop with this one and then talk about a strategic triangle and then I'll pause. So as a mentor over the years, one of the things I've seen is that when you talk about the healthcare value chain, your perspective really matters. I talked about the context, whether you're in Nigeria, whether in the USA or whether in the United Kingdom, your context really matters. If you're an entrepreneur listening to me today, the first thing that will be going on in your mind is this issue of, hmm, I have an idea, I have an idea, but friends, your idea is not enough, okay? You need to understand what is the need, what is the problem you want to solve? And that has got to be a problem. It is not a problem that you sat down and figured out in, 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 in a dark room all by yourself. You must be observing the environment around you to understand what the need is. Now, once you are able to define a need, put a finger on a problem, the resources naturally, naturally, evidence shows that they naturally always follow. Sometimes when you see people, you know, um, you see people answer, answer, produce an answer, they, as, the, as the British people would usually say, that, that that's, that's, that's an answer looking for its question. And, and that's a dangerous thing to have an answer that is searching for its question. So you must start with the question, and the question has its own natural answer. So if you're an entrepreneur, you're thinking about assets, you're thinking about 
uh, understanding need. If you're a, if you're a healthcare actuarial, you're thinking about what I just I said earlier about a, he a health maintenance organization. If I go back to this slide now, a health maintenance organization has done downstream uh, downstream integration, joining up providers and fiscal intermediaries. I think the HMOs of the future will join up fiscal intermediaries, providers, and purchasing. They will become increasingly um, super units that are doing purchasing and wholesale on scale. I don't think they will probably go to the point of production, but you never know. But but that sort of I think there are still opportunities. If you are if you are in healthcare actuarial, you are thinking there are opportunities. How do I position myself for strategic uh, competitiveness? I think there's a place to go in terms of upstream and downstream. Um, um, in, in integration right there. And then if you're a public health professional, I've just described one, how you can use data analytics to understand the need in different parts of your population because understanding need is critical to driving our value. And then finally, this is what takes me to the strategic triangle. If you've never heard about the strategic triangle, the strategic triangle is a, is a theory set out by a guy called Mark Moore. I think is Harvard School of Government. I'm not sure, um, um, and but it was a, is a wonderful work because what it does is that it takes the healthcare value chain and essentially interprets it in the context of a public professional, a public sector professional. So, and as a public sector professional myself, this is one of the things I found most valuable in setting out strategy for my teams and for the organizations where I work. And it starts with the concept of the public value. The public value is ex exactly what I've been talking about in terms of your customer values and expectations. What do the public want? What does my population need? And what is my value proposition to them as a result of one, my understanding of their needs and their expectation, and two, my understanding of my competencies, my processes, and my assets. That allows me to set out a value proposition for that particular population. And once you set out your value proposition, the next thing you think about is how you connect that in into your legitimacy and support. What Mark Moore also describes as your authorizing environment. And Mark Moore describes three types of your authorizing environment. There's your upward authorizing environment, your outward authorizing environment, and your downward authorizing environment. Your upward authorizing environment is your, is your external environment. Like for me, my upward authorizing environment is the health minister in Wales. So Whatever strategy I have, he has to approve that strategy. He has to, it has to be consistent with national Welsh government health policy. So for you, if you're an entrepreneur, uh, your authorizing environment might be your stakeholders, the people who have a financial stake in your investment, people who have an investment in your skills. And then there's the outward authorizing environment that is essentially your peers. And then there's your downward authorizing environment that is your teams, people who are your subordinates, who will need to buy into your vision and into your strategy. And then ultimately, once you have a very clear value proposition with a very clear understanding and buying from your authorizing environment, then that allows you to draw on operational capabilities beyond your traditional of operational capabilities. So it's not just about the budget you have. It's not just about the resources you have. It's also being able to leverage resources that are beyond your initial scope. Why? Because you have a compelling vision and a very clear statement and buying from your authorizing environment. I have found in my years of practice that when I'm working in a healthcare setting, as I am doing now, operating a thorough knowledge of the healthcare value chain and how I can identify and drive up value in our business is really important. When I interact with governments, as I also do, um, operating with a consciousness of the strategic triangle because they are like exactly two sides of one coin, the strategic triangle and the healthcare value chain. It's about interpretation of the same concepts in very different environments. So I know that I've spoken for how many minutes now? I wasn't timing myself, probably about 25, 30 minutes. Is it, was it up to that? Um, more or less. <laughs> more or less. Good. Okay, so uh, Daniel, I'm going to stop there. I know it's been a bit of a whistle stop store with some some um, detail in some areas. So I'll stop there. Take any comments or questions, and the questions don't have to relate directly to um, to my slides. Any question that you have in mind related to the topic uh, that I haven't covered, very happy to share my my perspectives. 
Excellent, fantastic. Thank you very much, Professor um, Noham. We really appreciate your um, insights there. I would believe that our listeners have been able to pick one or two things. This has um, been recorded, so you can always um, get access to um, at least the highlights, you know, of course. It's also streamed on, it's been streamed on Facebook as we speak, so I'd imagine that might also sit there um, quite nicely. So I think we would uh, gradually begin to move into the question and answer um, session. Um, prior to that, I would perhaps just um, play a very short, um, um, less than a minute type um, ad um, to allow people to perhaps gather their thoughts because I'm looking to see if we've got any questions on the chat. I'm still yet to see any come through. I'd imagine maybe some people might prefer to um, speak. If you'd like to ask your question directly, then you could signal, then we could uh, work out how you can um, have a conversation with our guest speaker. So bear with me while I um, put forward the very short ad. Starting, scaling, success. Three mountains you will have to scale in your lifetime if you're ever going to be successful. What if there was someone who could hold you by the hand so you could reach your destination faster? How much would it be worth to you? Introducing... Glocal Network's Match Me service that seamlessly brings you the perfect mentor for your personality, field of interest and skill set, all at affordable packages. You can finally supercharge your productivity, learn new skills and develop existing ones with a penny. Get started now with Glocal Networks. Sincere apologies, my mouth just decided to pack up at a crucial time. So, excellent. So I'm waiting to get questions come through, but um, before we do that, I guess I'd start with a, a simple basic question. And it is the case um, that, do, do I have to have um, a medical background to be able to explore the opportunities um, that are within the healthcare value chain? And, and if not, um, what are you know the, the the major let me say top three that you see that kind of must be tapped into very quickly in terms of you know um, maybe not they have strategic opportunities that people can begin to investigate very quickly is that is there um, um, any clarity with you in terms of your experience so uh, I I think. I, I think it, again, it depends on your your perspective. So, but let me start with the first question. So, absolutely, you don't need to be medically qualified um, to take advantage of the opportunities in the healthcare value chain. Um, in, in fact, uh, doctors are probably the worst people to to do that uh, because the, the the danger of medical education is that medical education teaches you to be a technocrat, teaches you to be a diagnostician, doesn't teach you a lot about business doesn't teach you a lot about um, how to identify opportunities. Um, so so uh, you, you definitely don't need a medical qualification to be able to do that. What you need, most of all, is to be a student. Um, and anyone who isn't interested in being a student is not interested in taking advantage of the opportunities around them. Why? Because identifying opportunities requires a studious mind. Um, I'm being a student, I'm not talking about necessarily reading big textbooks. I'm just saying, be observant, be studious, ask questions, um, um, look at what's going on around, around your environment. And one of the things I set out in, in the presentation was how context matters. If you're operating in the, in the UK, 
the opportunities in healthcare value chain are very different from what they are in the United States, which is a completely different healthcare market. It's completely different again in Nigeria, which is a more, um, um, for want of a better word, it's a more primitive is not the right word, that, that's more pejorative. What I mean is that it's a market on a different trajectory um, from the other markets. Uh, so for example, there isn't any universal basic care, healthcare package in Nigeria, unless perhaps more recently, when I know the federal government has been trying to put universal health care, make it available, but still consistently not available to many people. So the opportunities in the Nigerian markets are immense. They are just simply immense. Whereas in the UK, they feel saturated, whereas and in, the, in, the, in the United States, they are more dynamic. Um, so if there's one attribute that I think you need, it is that you need to be to be studious and to be observant and to get the right mindset. And hopefully that the wrong mindset is one of the things I've addressed. The wrong mindset is to think I'm, I'm, I'm not able to do anything because I don't have resources. I don't have anyone who's going to invest in me. That's just wrong mindset. Customers, investors invest where they see value and value it can be created and it takes a studious mind to understand how to create value. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think you got me. That was a pregnant question. I made it two in one. Excellent. Nicely put. So we need to have a studious mindset. So got two questions come through now. One of them is, I'll try and take it slowly. What kind of data do you think we can use in countries with poor or scarce data that can inform assessing the service needs? For instance, in the UK, you are sure to be able to have to um, access the data, but this will be hard in places like Nigeria. So it, you you are you are right. Um, uh, I, I remember in, in 2013 going back to um, University of Lagos to do some work with the with the College of Medicine there, and. Um, they, they wanted some interaction in terms of strengthening their research, their research approach. Um, and and the, the question was, I came thinking in the research environment here in the UK, we're quite used to doing randomized control trials, retrospective studies, prospective studies, many observational and interventional studies. And when I, when I looked at the research that was preponderant in, in the departments then, many of them were knowledge attitudes and practices, knowledge attitudes and practices, so surveys essentially. Now in the hierarchy of research, surveys are like the lowest level um, because you're not doing any observation, you're just collecting cross-sectional data. And that is reflective of the wider environment that you just described in that question, that when you're looking for data, Sometimes data is very hard to find because the research environment is not sufficiently incentivized. So that creates a real problem. Walk around to that. I think one of the key walkarounds to that is if we're talking about creating value and not being able to understand what populations need um, from existing research, then you are going to have to conduct research. Now, when I say conduct research, I'm not asking you to do massive randomized control trials that require funding in millions of dollars or millions of pounds or anything like that, that you can actually undertake intelligent surveys that are not just knowledge attitudes and practices surveys. So we've given an example of uh, an entrepreneur who looks at the HMO industry, for example, and goes, look, HMOs have integrated downstream, but actually, isn't there a place for upstream in integration of HMOs? And could you, could you, for example, then initiate a survey of, of HMOs, for example. See, what you're trying to do is that you're trying to generate knowledge because that's what research is. Research is about generation of knowledge. The methodology you use to generate that knowledge is almost irrelevant in a sense. So there are ways to get around it that are, are, that are relevant or that are adaptable to the context in which we find ourselves in a low resource environment. I get that. And so you don't need millions of dollars to be doing massive randomized control trials. There are intelligent surveys that you can do, but the most important thing is to make your question intelligent. What you often find is that people conduct knowledge attitudes and practices to have 
research publications, but sometimes they are really not intelligent questions that advance the, the, the subject. So the most important thing for me is to ask the right question. And there are, from my experience, low resource opportunities or mechanisms to generate that knowledge, even in a low resource setting like in Nigeria. Thank you very much for that. Excellent. So the opportunities are there. I think it's the mindset that needs to um, adjust to um, how to tap into the value. And I dare say that there's opportunities for collaboration with people who are within and outside Nigeria. And that's the idea for um, these kind of conversations and global networks. So the other question very quickly, and I'll take it quite slowly, I'll try, is that I, his, the um, participant said, I observed that during the discussion, you gave a brief overview of the healthcare value chain, but you didn't talk about pharmaceutical value chain. He says that he believes from dr drug discovery and development to drug marketing, that it provides and opens a wide variety of opportunity. That is there a reason for this? So, um, so well, first of all, there was no clever reason to not go in, into the pharmaceutical value chain. So you're right to ask that question. The pharmaceutical value chain is a very, very important and interesting one for a number of reasons. So um, COVID has been terrible, hasn't it? Okay, particularly in, 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 in other continents outside of Africa. Um, and if it wasn't for COVID, um, the sort of dynamism in vaccine production, for example, that we've seen in recent weeks and months would probably not have happened. And if I'm honest, the, the pharmaceutical industry came to a place of crisis um, in recent years. And the, the, the um, colleague who is asking the question is Adedai or Deoye. So you may know, if you, if you work in the pharmaceutical industry, you may know that the pharmaceutical industry came to a place of crisis um, for, for many years because there, uh, they, there seemed to be saturation in innovation. And if you think about the medications that we use today for pretty much many diseases, if they are not um, uh, the ones that are based on molecular medicine, like some cancer treatments and immunomodulators, where there seems to be a little bit of dynamism. But think about antihypertensive treatments. When was there the last innovation that generated a massive antihypertensive medication? We're still using drugs like aldromets, drugs like amlodipine. These are medications that like how many years, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. So there was, there's a sense that in the pharmaceutical industry for many years, they came to a set of a place of crisis because there wasn't innovation anymore. And then the, the incentives that pharmaceutical companies used to receive in terms of investing huge amounts of money into research was somehow undercut by intellectual property challenges. So you can invest huge amounts of money invest in those, uh, that amount of money, produce new medications, and then you have IP that lasts 10 years. By the time your IP is done, um, the manufacturers in India have already got all, you know, all of your, and then they can produce um, huge quantities of the same medications that essentially undercut your, so you are under pressure, you're under pressure if you're a pharmaceutical company to recoup all of your research investments with some overhead uh, and profits on top of that, you're under pressure to do it within a few years. But to do that within a few years means that you have to highly mark your mark up your, the cost of your medications. Now, in the United Kingdom, because of the way the National Health Service purchases medications, there's a downward pressure on you to be able to do that. And then secondly, because of Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, that has also put some downward pressure on the Ameri American pharmaceutical industry. So I think all of those things, uh, uh, there's a confluence of reasons why it was felt that innovation in pharmaceutical industry faced a bit of challenge. But having said that, there is still innovation in there. There is still some opportunities in there. The recent vaccine platforms, if you know what has happened with COVID vaccines now, completely new technologies that they have used. The AstraZeneca, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is a completely different 
vector, different technology they have used. The, the Moderna vaccine that was that passed its phase three trials recently, completely different technology. So there, there seems to be some dynamism again, once again, in, 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 in big pharma. And I, I encourage you, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't go into a lot of detail about the pharmaceutical value chain, but I 100% agree with you that there are opportunities there. If you are interested in understanding more and more of the opportunities in the, value, in the healthcare value chain, there are equal opportunities, perhaps even more opportunities in the pharmaceutical value chain. Um, but I do have to add that those opportunities are more than supply chain issues. I were talking, we are not talking about supply chains here. We're talking about value chain. And I think there are huge opportunities in the pharmaceutical industry, despite the recent stagnation of, of innovation there. Thank you very much, Frank. That was um, really useful. Um, thank you, we appreciate that. Um, still expecting to see if we would find any more questions, perhaps before any questions would come in. Um, I was going to mention that the underpinning reason why we have um, looked to put forward Global Networks as a platform is to help the many projects and business ideas and opportunities that would likely fail for lack of experience, sponsorship, and the knowledge of engaging opportunities to find connections on the platform and beyond. So the idea is that we are able to quite easily guarantee the matching of mentors and mentees at the most basic level. So you just want a one hour chat, it's actually a free session. The only thing that you're gonna to commit to is um, a fee that says, I am interested. Otherwise it's not about paying anybody <laughs> for the services that are being provided. So that's the general idea behind this kind of um, initiative. And we're looking to put forward um, more of these webinars. So it'll be interesting to find um, a sense of which sectors you'll be looking to get additional knowledge in. I'm unsure why we didn't have an, as much people as registered on this call. I'd imagine maybe it's a time difference that has um, kind of um, created a slight confusion between the UK and Nigeria having different timings. So before um, we come to an end, I think another question has come through. So I have another question for you, Prof. And the question is, how do you manage the security risks for a startup or growing business, especially in the Nigerian environment where you have kidnappings? I'm not sure how Prof is going to manage that. That, that, that feels like a question above my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, honestly, if I tried to offer any perspectives on that, I would be found very quickly out of my depth. I haven't, I haven't actively lived in Nigeria for 17 years now. I have visited, but I've not lived there. And, and so I, I have to own up and say, I honestly can't answer that question um, daily. Uh, but there might be other people on the platform who, who would have more brilliant ideas than myself. Thank you, Prof. That's the power, power of uh, knowledge. You know, you know what is in scope and out of scope. <laughs> uh, excellent. I'd imagine, you know, this may be where the benefit of, you know, sharing the links and connections would come in. For folks who are resident in Nigeria and are uh, able to operate in this space, I think perhaps it will be a, a case of how to build trust and progress any opportunities that are um, readily available. So I think we've got five minutes more. Um, in the absence of any more questions, because we have been very privileged, I must mention, to be able to get Professor Kalechi on board. His diary has been crazy. He's got a major assignment that signed up this weekend with the military and he, it's been back to, we have to fight for this space. So I'd like to really say and um, show a sense of appreciation. We're very grateful for this opportunity you've granted us and the time you spent with us. Um, looking forward to 
hopefully in the nearest future, opportunity to explore a bit more in any other area or aspects that the folks who are listening would be interested in taking a fairly um, broader um, perspective into. Because when it comes to deep dive, I'm aware that it would be almost impossible to explore this um, um, in any further depth. Thank you very much, Professor Gregory. Do you have any? Thank you. Any so thank, you. thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. As you rightly said, it was was a bit of a devil's job to pr to protect this space, but we managed to do that, and I feel very delighted to have been here, and um, I'm, I'd be very very happy to support this initiative. It's something that is very much in my heart to to um, to do these sort of things. Like I said, I have mentored um, over the years, and I keep on doing that. And if if I can share anything that would be helpful within what I know, I will. And I'll, as usual, I'll always be very careful about not varying things that I do not know, because of course I do not know everything. But it's been a pleasure to be with you.